Hi again. Welcome again to Basic Philippine Law and Your Students Channel. Uh, we are again uh, on the series of lectures on property and land law. Now we will discuss right of accession. Right of accession is the right of the owner to the fruits as well as the accessories of the property. It is part of the attributes or the rights of the owner to his property. It is an extension of his property rights to everything which is produced by the property or to everything which is incorporated or made an integral part of the property. The Article 440 tells us that the ownership of property gives the right by accession to everything which is produced thereby or which is incorporated thereto, either naturally or artificially. So the fruits of a property contemplates everything which is produced by the principal property as well as everything that is attached to the principal property. It is the jus fruendi. The right to the fruits, everything which is produced by the property, and the right to the accessories, everything which is incorporated, the principal property. In right of accession, we always speak about the principal property. Okay? It is the property which produces the fruits, and it is the property also to which an accessory is incorporated or made an integral part of. Okay? One thing that we must always remember with respect to right of accession is that it is not a mode of acquisition of ownership. Okay? The right of accession is only an attribute of ownership or an extension of ownership to everything which is produced or attached to the principal property. It is not a mode of acquiring ownership. It is not like, for example, save or succession or donation, wherein it is a distinct mode of acquiring property. Okay, In this case, it is not a mode of acquiring property, but it is merely an extension of your ownership. Okay? Accession, uh, the right of with to the right to all which one's property produces. Okay? Uh, what is an accessory? An accessory is anything which is joined to another thing as an ornament or to render it more perfect or which accompanies it or is connected with it as an incident or as a, a subordinate to it. An accessory may be artificial or man-made, or it can be natural, as we will discuss later. There can be an accessory to real property. There can also be an accessory to personal property. Okay. First, we will go to the fruits, everything which is produced by the principal property. Fruits may be classified into three kinds under Article 441 of the Civil Code. To the owner belongs the natural fruits, the industrial fruits, and the civil fruits. What are natural fruits? Article 442 defines natural fruits as the spontaneous products of the soil, the young, and other products of animals. We must always remember that for a fruit to be considered as natural, okay, uh, there must be no human intervention in its production. Okay, because Article 442 tells us that it is the spontaneous products of the soil. If there is human intervention in its production, then it would not fall under natural fruits, but it would fall under industrial fruits. Now, what are industrial fruits? Those are produced by the lands of any kind through cultivation or labor. So if there is cultivation or labor in its production, okay, then uh, it is not a natural fruit but an industrial fruit. <clears throat> Civil fruits, on the other hand, are the rents of buildings, the price of leases of land and other property, and the amount of perpetual or life annuities or other similar income. 
Mm -hmm. With respect to the young and other products of animals, only such which are manifest or born are considered as natural or industrial foods. With respect to animals, it is sufficient that they are in the womb of the mother, although unborn. Okay, so it need not be uh, to be considered as uh, a fruit, even if they are in the womb of the mother, although unborn, uh, it is to be considered as a natural fruit. Okay. Uh, Article 443 tells us that he who receives the fruits has the obligation to pay the expenses made by a third person in their production, gathering, and preservation. So regardless of the good or bad faith of the person who invested in the production of the said fruits, there is a necessity uh, for the person who receives the fruits to pay the expenses made by a third person in their production, gathering, or preservation. Okay? This is consistent with the principle of unjust enrichment. Okay, in the case of equatorial realty versus Mayfair, okay, Mayfair was the lessee of a building. Uh, there was uh, a provision in the lease contract granting Mayfair a right of first refusal uh, to purchase the property. Before their, the lease contract ended, the properties were sold by Carmelo to Equatorial Realty, which prompted Mayfair to file a case for the annulment of the deed of absolute sale. So in this case, whether Equatorial was the owner of the subject property and could thus enjoy the fruits or rentals were from. So there were discussions on uh, diba, uh, rent is a civil thing. So whoever is the owner of the property enjoys the fruits, including the civil goods. So or the Supreme Court said that rent is indeed a civil good that belongs to the owner of the property, producing it by right of accession. The rentals that fell due from the time of the perfection of the sale to the petitioner until its recession by final judgment should belong to the owner of the property during that period. So in this case, there was a discussion on whether or not by virtue of the execution of the deed of sale, okay, does uh, Equatorial uh, is, pro is the property, is the ownership of the property already transferred to Equatorial? So the Supreme Court said the right is transferred not by contract alone but by tradition or delivery. When the thing sold is placed in the control and possession of the bank, not having been the owner, petitioner cannot be entitled to the civil fruits of ownership like rentals of the, the thing sold. So uh, the constructive or symbolic delivery of execution of the deed of sale would not suffice because the thing sold has not been placed in the control or possession of the bed. Okay, Republic versus Holy Trinity. So in this case, this is a complaint for expropriation against the landowners filed by the Toll Regulatory Board. So there, of course, there, in expropriation cases, there is payment of just compensation. Now that payment of just compensation is deposited, okay, in the account of the owner of the property being expropriated. Now, uh, of course, that in that uh, deposit earns interest. Now the interest earned by the deposited amount in the expropriated account would accrue to to wholly. Um, to HRTDC by virtue of accession, hinges on the determination of who actually owns the deposited amount. So since the CA found that HTRDC is the owner of the deposited amount, then the latter should also be entitled to the interest which accrued thereof. It is entitled by right of accession to the interest that had accrued to the said amount. So the interest is considered as a civil 
So whoever is the owner of the amount deposited naturally also owns the interest on the deposited amount. Okay, we go now to industrial accession. Article 445 tells us, whatever is built, planted, or sown on the land of another and the improvements or repairs thereon belongs to the owner of the land subject to the provisions of the following articles. Okay? Of course, since you are the owner of the land, which is the principal property, okay, if there is any construction or building on your land or crops which are in your land, as well as sowings on your land, the presumption is that it is the owner of the land who built, planted, or sown on the land. Okay, that, that is, however, only a presumption. Okay, um, th there can be proof to the contrary. Okay, as stated in Article 446. All work sowings and plantings are presumed made by the owner and at his expense unless the contrary. Okay. Now, Article 447 tells us that the owner of the land who makes their own personally or through another plantings, constructions, or works with the materials of another shall pay their value. And if he acted in bad faith, he shall be obliged to the reparation of damages. The owner of the material shall have the right to remove them only in case he can do so without injury to the works constructed or without the plantings, constructions, or works being destroyed. However, if the landowner acted in bad faith, the owner of the materials may remove them in any event with the right to be indemnified for damages. Remember, Article 447 speaks of a situation wherein the owner of the land okay, used the materials of another to make buildings, plantings, or stonings. Okay, we are speaking here of two persons. The owner of the land, which is the principal property, and the owner of the materials, which was uh, made an integral part of the land. So in that case, what is the right of the owner of the materials? The right of the owner of the materials is to be paid the value of the materials. What if the owner of the land refuses to pay and there is bad faith on his part? The owner of the materials can remove okay, the buildings, plantings, or sowings on which his materials are used okay, regardless of uh, whether it would destroy the uh, uh, buildings, plantings, or so. Okay? And the uh, owner of the land has to indemnify the owner of the materials for damages. Okay? What if uh, uh, there is good faith on the part of the owner of the principal thing or owner of the land? Okay? Then the right of the owner of the materials is to be paid the value of the materials. However, if the owner of the land does not pay the owner of the materials, then he has a limited right of removal. The owner of the materials can remove okay, the buildings, plantings, or sowings if he can do so without injury to the works constructed or without the plantings, constructions, or works being destroyed. Okay? Uh, what if uh, the owner of the principal or the owner of the land uh, uh, what if the owner of the materials cannot remove them okay without causing injury or without destroying the plantings or constructions what had, what can he do he can file a suit for collection because of the presence of good faith there is only a limited right of removal Okay, Article 448, the owner of the land on which anything has been built, sown, or planted in good faith 
shall have the right to appropriate as his own the works sowing or planting after payment of indemnity or to oblige the one who built plant or planted to pay the price of the land and the one who sold the proper rent. However, the builder or planter cannot be obliged to buy the land if its value is considerably more than that of the building or the trees. In such a case, he shall pay reasonable rent. If the owner of the land does not choose to appropriate the building or trees after proper indemnity, the party shall agree upon the terms of the lease, and in case of this agreement, the court shall fix the terms thereof. Again, Article 448 speaks of two persons. The owner of the principal, which is the land, okay, and the builder, planter, or sower in good faith. Okay? That, is, uh, that is what distinguishes Article 448 from the other articles. Okay, the builder or planter or sower in Article 448 is in good faith. Okay, so we have here a land on which a building or a structure is there, or there are crops there, or there are sowings there, which is made not by the owner of the principal, not by the owner of the land, but by another person who acted in good faith. Okay. Now, what will be the rights of the uh, owner of the land, which is the principal thing, and the owner of the accessory, which is the building, planting, or sowing? Okay, because the owner of the principal, okay, is the because the owner of the land is the owner of the principal thing. Okay, he has the right to choose. Okay, the owner of the land has the right to choose. Okay, whether to appropriate the building, the crops, or the sowings. Okay, however, he has the obligation to pay indemnity to the builder, planter, or sower in good faith. That is his first option. Okay, what if he does not want to appropriate the building, planting, or sowing? He can ask. The, the builder, planter, or sower to pay the price of the land. However, this is only a limited right. He can only do so if the price of the land is less than the price of the building, planting, or sowing. If the price of the land is higher, then his option is to compel the builder, planter, or sower to pay the rent. To pay reasonable rent. So a lease agreement will be forged between the two parties. Okay, so that option is given to the owner of the principal or the owner of the land. Okay, uh, this can be better illustrated in the following cases. How, uh, pending the payment of the indemnity, example, if the owner of the land chooses to appropriate the building or the crops or the sowing, okay, what will be the right of the builder, planter, or sower? Okay, what if it takes the owner of the land years before he could produce the amount needed to pay the building, for example, okay? In the meantime, the builder, planter, or sower in good faith enjoys the right of retention, meaning he can stay on the property, he can stay on the building or the structure until he gets paid for the structure by the owner of the land, okay? Um, what if, for example, the owner of the land chooses to uh, compel the owner, the builder, planter, or sower to buy the land. However, it took the builder, planter, or sower years and he has not yet paid the land. What will be the option of the owner of the uh, land? Okay, 
In such a case, he's given two options. He can either require the removal of the structure or the plantings or the sowings, or he can either uh, sell, okay, sell the building as well as the land and then get from the proceeds of the sales payment of the land and the remainder thereof to be given to the builder, planter, or sower. Okay, so we will discuss it in more detail once we get to the cases. Okay, Gaboya versus P. In this case, Kui was the owner of several lots, which he sold to three of his children. Okay, a building, but he retained for himself the use of rock of the property. Okay, a building was constructed on the lot, and the builder or owners thereof received and continued to receive the rents. So the question is whether the use of rock reserved by the vendor over the lots gave the use of rocktory the right to receive the rentals of the commercial building. Remember, class, that when uh, we sold the three lots to his children, he reserved for himself the use of rock. And when he sold the lots, the property, the lot was vacant. It was his children who constructed a commercial building and from which they derived the rents. So who is entitled to the rent, which is a civil fruit, right? So nowhere in these articles on industrial accession, accession is there any mention of the case of the landowner building on his own land with materials owned by himself. Remember, class, the provisions on industrial accession was not made applicable to the case of Kaboya precisely because the building, the lot was already sold to the children. Okay, and they were the ones who built on that property. So, uh, the Article 448 is applicable only if the owner of the land and the builder, planter, or sower are two different persons. Okay, in this case, the owner of the principal, which is the land, and the one who built on the land is one and the same person. So the rules on accession will not apply. Okay, there is nothing in the authorities that specifically deals with constructions made by a party on his own land with his own materials and at his own expense. It limits the cases of industrial accession to those involving land and materials belonging to different owners. That the use of fracturary rights of we was over the land alone and did not entitle him to the rents of the group. Okay? Makasaet versus Makasaet. So in this case, Petitioners Ismael and Teresita and the respondents Vicente and Rosario are uh, first degree relatives. Ismael is the son of the respondents and Teresita is his wife. So the parents who are the owners of the land filed an ejectment suit against their children. So uh, they claim that the respondents had invited them to construct their residence and business on the lots in order that they could all live near one another. So that was the claim of the children. Uh, as extended family, the parents want them to live beside their house. So can, can the children or the respondents, Ismael, be considered as a builder in good faith? We have here a situation huh, where the owner of the principal, the lot, is the parent. And the owner of the structure is the child. Okay, The child was given permission by the parents while they were still in good terms to build the structure, their house, okay, in the lot owned by their parents. However, because they had a misunderstanding, okay, uh, uh, the the parents ejected, wanted to eject the children. Okay, now can you consider 
Ismael as a builder in good faith. So in this case, the court ruled this provision covers only cases in which builders, sowers, or planters believe themselves to be the owners of the land or at least to have a claim of title there too. It does not apply when the interest is merely that of a holder, such as a mere tenant, agent, or use of property. From these pronouncements, good faith is identified by the belief that the land is owned or that by some title, one has the right to build, plant, or sow their own. Okay, this provision was applied. Article 448 applies to the present factual milieu. The established facts show that respondents fully consented to the improvements introduced by the petitioners. In fact, because the children occupied the lots upon their invitation, the parents certainly knew and approved of the construction of the improvements introduced thereon. Thus, petitioners may be deemed to have been in good faith when they built the structures of those lots. Okay, so they were considered by the court as builders in good faith because of the fact that they constructed the lots on the, uh, the, the structures on the lots on the lot of their parents because they were invited and their parents knew that uh, they were constructing the said house on their lot. So that was considered by the court as uh, indicative of good faith. Del Ocampo versus Abesha. In this case, plaintiffs and defendants are co-owners. So they, they are co-owners of a lot. Okay? The co-ownership is terminated by the partition and it appears that the house of the defendants overlaps or occupies a portion of five square meters of the land pertaining to the plaintiffs. Because you know, in co-ownership, there is co-ownership. You don't own a specific portion of uh, the entire co-owned property. So your, your aliquot share or your ideal share or portion in the co-ownership will only be determined upon partition. However, during the existence of the co-ownership, one of the co-owners built on the co-owned property. However, upon partition, it turned out that a portion of the property on which he built uh, his uh, structure uh, did not has not been allocated to him. Okay, so uh, that is considered by the court as um, one which is built on good faith. Manresa agreed that the said provision may apply even when there was co ownership if good faith has been established. Okay. Otherwise, the plaintiffs may oblige the defendants to pay the price of the land. Okay? So it was applied to a situation when the owner of the land has given permission to the builder to construct on the land. Okay, It, it was also applied to a situation when one of the co-owners built on the land and that portion of... Uh, the, the uh, land on which he built uh, was not allotted to him when the property was partitioned. Okay, Pacific Farms versus Esquiera. In this case, the company sold and delivered lumber and construction materials to Insular, which uh, Insular used in the construction of buildings. Okay. So the appellant is there for an unpaid furniture of materials. So we have here two uh, persons, the owner of the land and the owner of the materials. So Article 447 contemplates a principal and an accessory. The land being considered the principal and the plantings or constructions the accessory. The owner of the land who in good faith makes constructions or works their own using materials belonging to somebody else, becomes the owner of the said materials 
with the obligation, however, of paying their value. Thus, the appellee, if it does own the buildings, must bear the obligation to pay for the value of the materials. The appellant, which apparently has no desire to remove the materials, has the right to recover the value of the unpaid lumber and construction material. So that is an illustration of Article 447, the case of Pacific Farms versus Esquera. Okay, Parilia versus Pilar. Parilia is in possession of a land which was leased to it by Pilar. So when the lease contract expired, petitioners remained in possession of the property on which they built improvements consisting of a billiard hall and a restaurant. Now, the factual milieu of the instance case calls then for the application of the provisions on lease. So, specific rules concerning useful improvements introduced by the lessee is it is erroneous to apply Article 448. So, when the parties are in a contract of lease, the provision on industrial accession will not apply. Okay, again, ha, when the parties are in a contract of lease, the provisions on lease will apply and not the provisions on industrial accession. Okay, Article 448 covers only cases in which the builders, sowers, or planters believe themselves to be owners of the land or at least have a claim or title thereto, but not when the interest is merely that of a holder, such as a mere tenant, agent, or use of fraction. So, if you are a lessee and you uh, uh, constructed improvements on the leased property, it is the provisions on lease that would apply. And you will not be considered as a builder, planter, or sower in good faith. Okay? Bilia C versus Garcia. While the building was declared for taxation purposes in the name of FGCI, the lots in which it was erected were registered in the names of spouses Garcia. Okay? The accessory follows the principle that is the ownership of the property gives the right of accession to everything which is produced thereby or which is incorporated or attached thereto, where there is a clear and convincing evidence to prove that the principal and the accessory are not owned by one and the same person, the presumption shall not be applied and the actual ownership shall be upheld. So, on instances where this court was confronted with cases, requiring judicial determination of the ownership of the building separate from the lot. It never hesitated to disregard such rule. So the case at bar is of similar import. When there are factual and evidentiary evidence to prove that the building and the lot on which it stands are owned by different persons, they shall be treated separate. Okay? Alviola versus Court of Appeals. So in this case, Tinagan is the owner of two parcels of land. So he was in possession of the subject property. However, petitioners occupied portions of the said property on which they built a copra dryer and put up a store. Okay. Um, petitioners have occupied the disputed portions. However, according to to the petitioners, uh, their stay on the property was by mere tolerance on the part of the private respondents. The evidence shows that petitioners were permitted by Tinagan to build a copra dryer on the land when they got married. So there was bad faith on the part of the petitioners when they constructed the copra dryer and store on the disputed portions since they were fully aware that the parcels of land belong to Tinagan. And there was likewise bad faith on the part of the private respondents having knowledge of the arrangement between petitioners and Tinagan. Okay, so in this case, will, you, will it call for the application of the rules on industrial accession under Article 448 
the Supreme Court said no. To fall within the provision of this article, the construction must be of permanent character attached to the soil with an idea of perpetuity. But if it is of transitory character or is transferable, there is no accession. So because the copra dryer is movable, okay, it can be removed from the land, okay, it is not considered as an industrial accession. And therefore, there is no need to apply Article 440. Okay, Pexon versus Corp, for, uh, Court of Appeals. So Pexon was the owner of a commercial lot. So the lot was sold at public auction to no spouses, no kids. So the trial court held that the apartment building was not included in the auction sale of the commercial lot. Okay. Uh, Article 448 does not apply to a case where the owner of the land is the builder, sower, or planter, who then later loses ownership of the land by sale or donation. Where the true owner himself is the builder of the works on his own land, the issue of good or bad faith is entirely relevant. Okay, so uh, again, this is a reiteration of the rule that if the, the one who built, planted, or sold is the owner himself, okay, there is no need to apply the provisions on industrial accession. Okay, Article 449, he who builds, plants, plants, or sows in bad faith on the land of another loses what is built, planted, or sown without right to in them. So, uh, the important thing to remember with respect to builder, planters, or sowers in bad faith is that okay, the builder, planter, or sower in bad faith is always liable for damages. The builder, planter, or sower in bad faith loses what he built, planted, or sowed without right to indemnity. But the builder, planter, or sower in bad faith has a right to recover or to be reimbursed with the necessary expenses for the production of the cell buildings, plantings, or so. Okay, Article 450 uh, tells us that the owner of the land on which anything has been built, planted, or sown in bad faith may demand the demolition of the work or that the planting or sowing be removed in order to replace the things in their former condition at the expense of the person who built, planted, or sold. Or he, he may compel the builder, planter, or sower to pay the price of the land and the sower the proper rent. Okay, there are actually three options which are available to the owner of the land, which is the principal property, if the builder, planter, or sower is in bad faith. Okay, first he can appropriate. He can appropriate the buildings, plantings, or so means. Okay, there is also the obligation on the part of the owner of the land to reimburse the uh, builder, planter, or sower in bad faith of the necessary expenses uh, which is incurred, which he incurred in the production of the crops in the erection of the building and in the sowings. Okay. Second option is he may demand for the removal of the uh, buildings, plantings, or sowings. Okay. Or he may compel the builder, planter, or sower in bad faith to pay the price of the land. In all instances, is the, the owner of the principal or the owner of the land is entitled to damages. Whatever option he chooses, whether he wants to appropriate, whether he compels the builder, planter, or sower to buy the land, whether he compels the builder, planter, or sower to remove the expense, okay? He is always entitled to damages, okay? That is under Article 451. Under Article 452, the builder, planter, or sower in bad faith is entitled to reimbursement for the necessary expenses of preservation of the land. This is to prevent unjust enrichment. Okay, um, 
in, in if the owner of the land chooses to appropriate the buildings, plantings, or sowings, there is always an obligation on the part of the owner of the land to pay to pay the builder, planter, or sower the necessary expenses of preservation of the land. Okay, but the the thing that differentiates a builder, planter, or sower in good faith from the builder, planter, or sower in bad faith is that if you are in bad faith, okay, you don't have the right of redemption. Meaning, the uh, builder, planter, or sower in bad faith cannot stay on the building or cannot uh, have possession of the plantings while waiting for the payment of reimbursement. If you are in good faith, you have the right to retain the buildings, plantings, or sowings until you get paid by the owner of the land. That is the main difference between them. Of course, aside from the damages. Okay, Article 453, if there was bad faith, not only on the part of the person who built, planted, or sowed on the land of another, but also on the part of the owner, of such land, the rights of one and the other shall be the same as though both had acted in good faith. So the bad faith of one neutralizes the bad faith of the other. Okay, what is bad faith? Bad faith on the part of the landowner whenever the act was done with his knowledge and without opposition on his part. Okay. Article 454, when the landowner acted in bad faith and the builder, planter, or sower proceeded in good faith, the provisions of Article 447 shall apply. Article 445 also tells us that if the materials, plants, or seeds belong to a third person who has not acted in bad faith, the owner of the land shall answer subsidiarily for their value and only in the event that the one who made use of them has no property with which to pay. So this speaks of a situation where there are three people, the owner of the land, the builder, planter, or sower, and the owner of the materials, plants, or seeds. Okay? This provision shall not apply if the owner makes use of the right granted by Article 450. If the owner of the materials, plants, or seeds has been paid by the builder, planter, or sower, the latter may demand from the landowner the value of the materials and paper. So in the cases regulated in the preceding articles, good faith does not necessarily exclude negligence, which gives right to damages under Article 217. Okay? Bernardo versus Bataclan. In this case, by a contract of sale, Bernardo acquired ownership of a parcel of land. To secure possession of the land from the vendors, the plaintiff filed against uh, filed the case against them. Plaintiff was declared the owner, but the defendant was held to be a possessor in good faith entitled to reimbursement. The principal where, however, the planter, builder, or sower has acted in good faith, a conflict of rights arises between the owners and it becomes necessary to protect the owner of the improvements without causing injustice to the owner of the land. We have here a state of forced co-ownership because you have here the owner of the land and the owner of the buildings, plantings, or sowings. The law has provided a just and equitable solution by giving the owner of the land the option either to acquire the improvements after payment of indemnity or to oblige the builder or planter to pay for the land and the, the sower to pay the rent. It is the owner of the land who is allowed to exercise the option because his right is older and because by the principle of accession, he is entitled to the ownership of the accessory thing. The land, as we have already said, requires no more than the owner of the land should choose between indemnifying the owner of the improvements 
for requiring the latter to pay for the land. When he failed to pay for the land, the defendant herein lost his right of retention. Republic versus Balyopana. So in this case, uh, there was a certain piece of land which Reyes bought, and he introduced improvements, planted the land with fruit trees. However, it turned out that a large portion of the land is timber land and therefore is considered as a property of public dominion. So, Articles 448 and 546 of the Civil Code grants the builder or planter in good faith full reimbursement of useful improvements and retention of the premises until reimbursement is made. A builder or planter in good faith is one who builds or plants on the land with the belief that he is the owner thereof, unaware of any flaw in his title to the land at the time he builds or plants on it. So in this case, the Supreme Court considered Reyes as a builder in good faith because at the time that he built improvements, uh, at the time that he construct, uh, constructed, at the time that he uh, planted fruit-bearing trees on the property, uh, the property was titled in his name. However, it turned out that the property is beyond the commerce of man because it is timberland and therefore a property which is needed for the development of our national wealth. So it cannot be uh, the subject of commerce. Okay, But he has already planted improvements on the property. So Reyes was a planter in good faith. He was of the belief that he was the owner. In fact, a TCT was issued in his name. He tilled the land, planted fruit trees, and invested money on it. To order Reyes to simply surrender all of these fruit bearing trees in favor of the state will result in unjust enrichment. However, there is only one option available, and that is payment of indemnity. Okay, because uh, the option to compel him to buy the land is no longer available. Okay. Espinosa versus Mayantok. A parcel of land was originally owned by Eusebio after his death. Said parcel of land was divided among his heirs. Now, the petitioners in this case filed an action for annulment of document and a decision was rendered in their favor. So, respondents filed a complaint for reimbursement for useful expenses, alleging that the house was built on the disputed land in good faith. According to the respondents, they then believed themselves to be the owners of the land with a claim of title, and they were never prevented by the petitioners in constructing the house. To be deemed a builder in good faith, it is essential that a person asserts title to the land on which he builds, that he be a possessor in the concept of owner and that he be unaware that there exists in his title or mode of acquisition any flaw which invalidates it. The settled rule is that bad faith should be established by clear and convincing evidence, since the law always pursues good faith. In this particular case, petitioners were not able to prove that the respondents were in bad faith in constructing the house on the subject land. So there is a burden on the part of the person asserting bad faith to establish that there was really bad faith. If um, the uh, ones asserting bad faith were not able to establish the same, then it will be presumed that good faith is present. Okay? The rule is that the right of choice belongs to the owner of the land is in accordance with the principle of Accession. However, even if the right of choice is exclusive to the landowner, he cannot refuse to exercise either option and demand instead for the removal of the building. Remember that when there is good faith, the option of the landowner is limited only to two: either to appropriate the building planting or so or sowing, or to compel the builder, planter, or sower to buy the land. If its value is less than the building, planting, or sowing, or 
uh, in case its value is greater than the building planting or sowing, to have a forced lease or to compel the builder, planter, or sower to pay the rent. Okay? Baliatan versus for the appeals. Okay, the parties herein are owners of adjacent house. Okay, respondent who constructed his house, his house adjacent to a lot, which is registered in the name of the respondent. So Balyatan made a written demand on Go to remove and dismantle their improvements. However, Go refused. So there is no evidence, much less any allegation, that respondent was aware that when he built his house, he knew that a portion thereof encroached on respondent Go's adjoining land. Good faith is always presumed and upon him who alleges bad faith rests the burden. So it was made to apply to a situation uh, wherein uh, there is permission on the part of the parents to construct a house, uh, but it turned out later that uh, uh, there was a misunderstanding. Okay, uh, it was also made to apply in a case where there are co-owners. Okay. Uh, it was also made to apply in a case when the property was discovered to be timberland and there were already plantings made by the owner. And it was also made to apply to a case when there was a mistake, uh, when somebody built on an adjacent property, which turned out to be uh, owned by the uh, owner of the land adjacent to the said property. So if the owner chooses to sell his land, the builder, planter, or sower must purchase the land. Otherwise, the owner may remove the improvements thereof. Article 448 has been applied to improvements or portions of the improvements built by mistaken belief on land belonging to an adjoining owner. Okay? Technogas versus Court of Appeals. So the parties in this case are again owners of adjoining land. It was discovered that a portion of the building, which was presumably constructed by its predecessor in interest, encroached on a portion of the land owned by the respondent. So petitioner, uh, unless one is versed in the science of surveying, no one can determine the precise extent or location of his property by merely examining the state title. So when petitioner purchased the land, the buildings and other structures were already in existence. So the record is not clear as to who actually built those structures. So it is presumed that possession continues to be enjoyed in the same character in which it was acquired. So good faith consists in the belief of the builder that the land he is building on is his and his ignorance of any defect or flaw in title. So in both of these cases, Baliatan and Technogas, okay, one who constructed on a portion of a land uh, which turned out to be late, uh, later to be owned by, the uh, by owned by the owner of the adjacent lot was held to be a builder in good faith. Okay? Filipinas Colleges versus Timpa. So in this case, it is contended that because the builder in good faith has failed to pay the price of the land after the owners thereof exercised their option under Article 448, the builder lost his right of protection. The appellants as owners of the land automatically became the owners of the building. Remember, the ba? Uh, the owner of the land has two options, either to appropriate the building or to compel the uh, builder to pay the price of the land. So we have here a case wherein the, the landowner chose the second option, which is to compel the builder to uh, pay the price of the land. However, the builder has failed to pay the price of the land. Does it mean uh, that because of the 
uh, failure of the builder to pay the price of the land, does it mean that the owner of the land automatically becomes the owner of the building? So that is uh, the issue here in Filipinas. Okay, so the Supreme Court said there is nothing in the language of these two articles which would justify the conclusion of the appellants that upon the failure of the builder to pay the value of the land, when such is demanded by the landowner, the latter becomes automatically the owner of the improvements. In the event of failure of the builder to pay for the land, after the owner has chosen this alternative, the builder's right of retention is lost. Nevertheless, there was nothing that said that as a consequence thereof, the builder loses entirely all rights over his own building. The question is, what is the recourse or remedy left to the parties in such an event when the builder fails to pay the value of the land? So, the owner of the land is entitled to have the improvement removed and after having chosen to sell his land to the other party, the builder in good faith fails to pay the same or he can sell the land and the improvement at a public auction, applying the proceeds there offers to the payment of the value of the land and the excess, if any, to the builder. Okay? So, in case option number two is chosen, meaning the builder was compelled to pay the price of the land, but the builder does did not pay. So, the owner of the land has two options, either to remove the building or to sell the building at public auction and apply the proceeds first to pay the value of the land and the remainder, if any, okay, to be given to the land uh, to the builder as payment for the value of the building. But it doesn't give the owner of the land the right to appropriate the building when the landowner fails to pay the value of the land. Okay. IRDC versus Court of Appeals, it is true that under Article 440, the ownership of the property includes the right of accession uh, to everything which is attached thereto. It is equally true that when a person plants in good faith, the landowner does not acquire ownership of what has been planted. He must first indemnify the planter before he can appropriate the same. Okay? But in this case, the petitioner has alleged good faith in planting the sugar cane, thus giving rise to conflict of rights, which poses the issue of the protection of the alleged planter in <clears throat> Princess Rachel versus Hilby. This is an illustration of what bad faith is all about. In the previous cases of Baliatan as well as Technogas, the Supreme Court has consistently held that if you uh, have built on a portion of the land, of the adjacent land, which belongs to another person, the Supreme Court has upheld good faith, saying that a lay person uh, cannot be presumed to know the technicalities of the uh, uh, needs and bounds of this property. Okay, but uh, <clears throat> compare and contrast the cases of Technogas and Baliatan. So, this case of Princess Rachel versus King. So, in this case, Princess Rachel built condominium units on an encroached area. Uh, it uh, defined bad faith. As it contemplates a state of mind affirmatively operating with furtive design or some motive of self-interest or ill will for ulterior purposes. To be deemed a builder in good faith, it is essential that a person asserts title to the land on which he builds, that he be a possessor in the concept of owner, and that he be un unaware that there exists in his title or mode of acquisition any flow which invalidates it. So the encroachment in the, in this case covers 2,783 square meters. Given that such encroachment is substantial, visible to the naked eye, 
and not merely negligible. Hillview could not feign ignorance before. Hillview is not an ordinary land owner, but a property developer. So Hillview is undeniably engaged in large-scale property development projects where it is expected to exercise a higher degree of diligence. A landowner is deemed in bad faith when there are circumstances indicating that he had become aware in the end of the encroachment and had chosen not to act on it. So in this case, uh, the Supreme Court um, did not um, sustain uh, Princess Ray, uh, Hillview when uh, it uh, contended that it is in good faith because of the uh, size of the encroachment as well as the uh, fact that Hillview is a property developer and therefore um, is expected to have a higher degree of expertise okay, with respect to knowing the meets and bounds of his property. Petitioners have the right to appropriate what has been built on its property without any obligation to pay indemnity due to its bad faith Hillview forfeits what it has built without any right to be paid in them. While necessary expenses shall be refunded, uh, neither does Hillview have the right of retention over the encroached portions as the right of retention is afforded only to possessors in good faith. PNB versus the Jesus. So in this case, the Jesus filed a complaint against PNB for the recovery of ownership and possession over the northern portion of the lot, which it acquired. KPNB claimed that when it acquired the lot and building from Ignacio, the encroachment was already in existence. Okay? Petitioner was quite aware and indeed advised prior to its acquisition of the land and building that a part of the building sold to it stood on the land and not covered by the land conveyed to it. Equally significant is the fact that the building constructed on the land by Ignacio has in actuality been part of the property transferred to the petitioner. So in this case, um, there was existence of bad faith because at the time that PNB acquired the property, he was already informed that a portion of the pro of the building has encroached on the on the adjacent property. So a builder in good faith can, and under the foregoing provisions, compel the landowner to make a choice between appropriating the building by paying the proper indemnity or obliging the builder to pay the price of the land. The choice belongs to the owner of the land, a rule that accords with the principle of accession that the accessory follows the principal. Even as the option lies with the landowner, the grant to him is preclusive. He must choose one. He cannot compel the owner of the building to instead remove it from the land. In order, however, that the builder can invoke that accruing benefit and enjoy his right to demand that a choice be made by the landowner, he should be able to prove good faith on his part. So good faith implies honesty of intention and freedom from knowledge of circumstances which should, which should put the holder upon inquiry. So petitioner fell short of this requirement. He was aware and advised prior to its acquisition that a part of the building sold to it stood on the land, not covered by the land conveyed to it. Okay, Bondok versus CA. In this case, Kiambao allowed Bondok to construct a temporary residential structure on the lot. Okay, uh, provided that petitioner would leave the land at any time he was required to do so. So Bondok can therefore not insist that he is a builder in faith uh, or demand payment for the improvements he has constructed, nor may he retain the same until reimbursement is paid. Okay, because uh, the parties were involved in a contract of lease. Okay, and as I've said before, as I have mentioned, 
uh, initially in the lecture, uh, when you are covered by a contract of peace, the provisions on in industrial accession is not applicable. So what would apply will be the provisions of the civil code on lease or your co the provisions on your contract, okay? But not the provisions on industrial accession. Okay, Lopez versus Sarabia. Well, in this case, Sarabia owned two lots. Okay, there is a residential house built on the lot. Now, spouses Lopez were renting the second floor. Okay, now, uh, spouses Lopez approached Sarabia and asked if they could construct additional rooms. However, uh, Sarabia told them that the there is, she still has a loan and she still paid off. Now, PN, uh, the spouses offered that they will be the one to obtain a loan and that they would use the property as collateral to pay off the existing loan and to get an additional loan from PNB to build additional structures. Okay. In order to facilitate the loan, however, it is necessary that the property be transferred in the name of the spouse's Lopez. So Sarabia agreed to the proposal of the spouse's Lopez. Spouse's Lopez mortgaged the properties to DBP and they obtained a loan. They paid PNB and then the spouse's Lopez is paying rentals to Sarabia and even collected the rentals from the other lot as part of the payment of the monthly amortization. However, Sarabia found out that the loan amortizations were not paid. So the petitioners allege that Article 448 applies in this case because they constructed the building on one of the lots in the concept of owner after the title has already been transferred to them. They believe that they have a right to build because they thought that they owned uh, the said lot. Okay, Article 448, which allow full reimbursement of useful improvements, uh, apply only to a possessor in good faith, one who builds on the land with the belief that he is the owner thereof. It was the agreement and intention that the titles would only be lent to them in order to secure the housing loan. Uh, there was no agreement or intention to transfer the ownership. So in this case, the builder, planter, or sower, and the owner of the land is one of the same person. And also, uh, the parties are so related that they are tenant or lessee. They, they are in a contract of lease, and therefore, there is no application of Article 4. Okay? Okay? So that is the last case on industrial accession to real property. Now we go to uh, natural or uh, natural accession to real property, meaning it is one which is attributed to nature and not to the works of man. Okay, we now go to accretion. What is accretion? So the owners of the land adjoining the banks of rivers belong the accretion which they gradually receive from the effect of the currents of the waters. Okay, Article 458, on the other hand, states that the owners of estates adjoining ponds or lagoons do not acquire the land left dry by the natural decrease of waters or lose that inundated by them in extraordinary floods. Okay, Article 459, whenever the current of a river or torrent segregates from an estate on its bank a known portion of a land and transfers it to another estate, the owner of the land to which the segregated portion belongs retains ownership provided that he removes the same within two years. Okay? Trees uprooted and carried away by the current of the waters belong to the owner of the land upon which they may be cast. If the owners do not claim them within six months, if such owners claim them, they shall pay the expenses incurred in gathering them or putting them in a state books. Okay, Article 461, river beds which are abandoned through the natural change in the course of the waters 
if sa pacto belong to the owners whose lands are occupied by the new course in proportion to the area loss. However, the owners of the lands adjoining the old bed shall have the right to acquire the same by paying the value thereof, which value shall not exceed the value of the area occupied by the new bed. Okay, Article 462. Whenever a river changing its course by natural causes opens a new bed through a private estate, this bed shall become a public domain. Okay, whenever a current of a river divides itself into branches, leaving a piece of land or part thereof isolated, the owner of the land retains his ownership. He also retains it if a portion of a land is separated from the estate by the current. Okay, then we go to the formation of islands. Under Article 464, islands, which may be formed on seas within the jurisdiction of the Philippines or lakes and on navigable or floatable rivers, they belong to the state. Okay, islands which through successive accumulation of alluvial deposits are formed in non-navigable and non-floatable rivers, belong to the owners of the margins or banks needed to each of them, or to the owners of both margins, if the island is in the middle of the river, in which case it shall be divided longitudin longitudinally in halves. If a single island thus form be more distant from more one margin than from the other, the owner of the nearer margin shall be the sole owner thereof. Okay? Gulia versus Labrador. In this case, Labrador filed a complaint against Gulia for action publishana over a titled lot. Okay, uh, according to the Labradors, the property was declared for taxation purposes under their names and the corresponding taxes thereon were paid. Now, Gulia occupied a portion of the property fronting the China Sea. Now, Gulia claimed that they had been in possession of the said since 1984 and declared the property for taxation purposes. Now, the MTC rendered judgment in favor of the Labradors. The RTC affirmed the MTC review. Now, the question is whether or not the petitioners are entitled to the possession of lot A which is located at the foreshore of San Felipe, San Valles. Petitioners point out that Lot A is not covered by any certificate of title, the free patent issued to respondents, as well as the tax declaration. Moreover, the lower courts earned in ruling that the salvage zone is incorporated in the title of the respondent. The RTC and the CA were one in ruling that the 562 square meter lot is part of public dominion, hence beyond the commerce of men and not capable of registration. The provision, however, does not apply in this case considering that lot A is a foreshore land adjacent to the sea, which is alternately covered and left dry by the ordinary flow of the tide. Such property belongs to the public domain and is not available for private ownership until formally declared by the government to be no longer needed for public use. So respondents thus have no possessory right over the property unless upon application the government has granted them a permit. Why? Because these are for sure lands. Okay, this is not an accession to your property. It is a for sure land. Okay? Grande versus Court of Appeals. So in this case, uh, a gradual accretion on the northeastern side portion took place by action of the Cagayan River. Okay? The bank had receded to a distance of about 105 meters and an alluvial deposit of 19,964 square meters has been added to the property of the petitioner. Whether respondents have acquired the allu alluvial property through prescription. So whether the accretion becomes automatically registered land 
because the lot which receives it is covered by a torrent's title, thereby making the alluvial property imprescriptible. We agree with the CA that it does not. Just as an unregistered land purchased by the registered owner of the adjoining lot does not by extension become its so facto registered land. Ownership of a piece of land is one thing. Registration under the Torrent system is another thing. Ownership over the accretion received by the land adjoining a river is governed by the civil code. So if, if there is accretion on a registered land, it does not automatically mean that the accretion is registered. Okay, so you, you have to apply for registration of the accreted portion. Okay, so registration is one thing. Okay, uh, accretion is another thing. Okay, so uh, if it is occupied, if the accreted portion is occupied by another person, he can acquire ownership thereof through prescription. Okay. Petitioners never sought registration of said alluvial property. So the implement, therefore, never became registered property and then it is not entitled or subject to the protection of imprescriptibility enjoyed by registered property. Consequently, it was subject to acquisition through prescription by third Okay. Republic versus Court of Appeals. So in this case, the Tansinkos, a registered owner of a titled parcel of land bordering on the Mekawayan and Bukawi rivers. So the private respondents filed an application for the registration of three lots adjacent to their fish pond property which was granted because they are the accretions to the fish pond. So the petitioner submits that there is no accretion to speak of because what actually happened is that private respondents simply transferred their dikes further down the riverbed of Mekawayan. And thus, if there is any accretion to speak of, it is man-made and artificial and not the result of the gradual and imperceptible sedimentation by the waters of the river. Okay, in RP versus CA, the Supreme Court found it opportune to enumerate the elements that are needed for accretion to take place. First, the deposit must be gradual and imperceptible, meaning it it uh, the deposit was made very slowly. It was made through time. Okay, that it is through the effect of the current of the water. Okay? And that the land where the accretion takes place is adjacent to the banks of rivers. So these three requirements must be present for the court to consider that the uh, added portion of land is really the result of an accretion. The requirement that the deposit should be due to the effect of the current of the river is indispensable. Alluvion must be the exclusive work of nature. In this case, there is no evidence to prove that the addition of the said property was made gradually through the effect of the current of the Mekawayan and Bukawi rivers. There is evidence that the alleged alluvial deposits were artificial and man-made. They are the result of the transfer of the dike towards the river and encroaching upon it. The reason behind the law giving the riparian owner the right to any land or alluvion deposited by a river is to compensate him for the danger of loss that he suffers because of the location of his land. If estates bordering on rivers are exposed to floods and other evils produced by the destructive force of the waters, and if by virtue of lawful provisions, said estates are subject to encumbrances and various kinds of easements, it is proper that the risk of danger, which may prejudice the owners thereof, should be compensated by the right of accretion. Okay? So, the Samparado versus Court of Appeals. Okay? This is another uh, case of uh, uh, man-made and not uh, a result of uh, natural uh, accretion. The subject of a controversy is a parcel of land formed 
as a result of sodas dumped into the dried up Malacana Creek and along the banks of Tagayan River. So they were claiming that the said property is an accretion. Now, whether or not the subject land is a public land, petitioners claim that the subject land is a private land being an accretion. Okay? In this case, they admit that the accretion was formed by the dumping of boulder, soil, and other filling materials on portions of the Balacana Street and the Cagayan River, bounding their land. It cannot be claimed, therefore, that the accumulation of such boulders was gradual and imperceptible, resulting from the action of the waters or the current of the Balacana Street. So it cannot be considered as an accretion. The word current indicates the participation of the body of the water in the ebb and flow of waters due to high and low tide. Petitioner's submission not having met the first and second requirements of the rules on alluvion, they cannot claim the rights of a riparian. This excludes all deposits caused by human intervention. Alluvion must be the exclusive work of nature. Remember that. Okay? For you to determine whether or not it is really an accreted property. Okay? De Los Reyes versus Calibo. Uh, in this case, uh, Lot number 2076 was registered in the name of Peralta. Uh, allegedly, through accretion, land was added to the said lot. Now, the municipality of Talibo sought to convert four hectares of said area of accretion into a garbage dump site. Now, Peral the Peraltas um, are not even registered owner of the area adjacent to the increment claim. They still did not register the subject increment under their needs. It is settled that an accretion does not automatically become registered land just because the lot that receives such accretion is covered by a torrent's title. Ownership is one thing, registration is another. Okay, again, the Supreme Court reiterated the requirements for uh the additional land to be considered as an, an accretion must be gradual and imperceptible made to the effect of the currents of the water and taking place on land adjacent to the banks of rivers. So Ignacio characterized the land in question as swampy and its increase is due to the change of the shoreline of the Visayan Sea and not, to, not through gradual deposits. Hence the questionable character of the land which could most probably be part of the public domain. Indeed, Barso said from validly transferring the increment to any of his successors. So because it is not due to the effect of the current of the waters. Okay, bias versus sport of appeals. So in this case, the controversy began when the government dug a canal on a private parcel of land identified as Lot 2958 to streamline the Tripa de Galina Creek. Okay. Article 461 states that riverbeds which are abandoned through the natural change in the course of the waters, if so facto belongs to the owners whose lands are occupied by the horse. However, the owners of the land adjoining the old bed shall have the right to acquire the same by paying the value thereof. So a portion of the creek was diverted to a man-made canal which totally occupied 2958. Thus, petitioners claim that they became the owners of the old bed. We find, however, that petitioners have already been compensated. Okay, He was given lot 3271 in exchange for the affected lot. To allow petitioners to acquire ownership of the dried up portion of the creek would be a clear case of double compensation. Okay, Banatao versus Dabai. In this case, the plaintiffs want to obtain judicial determination of ownership of a certain land situated in Pugo in the province of Cagayan. It appears that a new island made its appearance in the Cagayan River at or near the spot where the land in question is situated. 
As a result of the formation of this island, the Cagayan River was divided into three branches. So the change of the river has thus operated to destroy the character of Ugu as an island and has thereby become connected terrestrially with the land lying on the eastern bank of the Cagayan River. Okay, The trial court took the judicial notice of the fact that the Cagayan River is a navigable stream. The circumstance that the Cagayan River abandoned the old eastern bed instead of gradually shifting its course to the west makes it impossible for the defendant Dabai to maintain his claim to any part of the land in controversy as an accretion. Okay? Those articles declare that an island formed in a river by the successive accumulation of deposits belong to the riparian owners on the respective banks of the stream unless the island is farther from the bank than from the other. Okay? Um, in this case, it was observed by the trial judge that the plaintiffs were the first to appropriate the new island. The island was evidently treated as part of the public domain and the plaintiffs are therefore to be considered as having acquired their title from the government. Okay. Jagualing versus Court of Appeals Between one who has actual possession of an island that forms in a non-navigable, non-floatable river and the owner of the land along the margin nearest the island who has the better right. Okay, So we have a non-navigable river where an island was formed. One is in possession of the island the other one is the riparian owner who has the better right. So the land in litigation is an island that appears in a non-floatable and non-navigable river. On the other hand, private respondents do not dispute that the island has been the, in the actual physical possession of petitioners. Private respondents insist only that such possession is in the concept of caretakers. Okay. The island belongs to the owner of the land along the nearer margin, a sole owner thereof, or more accurately, because the island is longer than the property of private respondents, they are deemed it so jure to be the owners of that portion, which corresponds to the length of their property along the margin of the river. Lands formed by accretion belong to the riparian owner. This preferential right is also granted to the owners of land located in the margin nearest the formed island for the reason that they are in the best position to cultivate or exploit the same. Petitioners may therefore acquire said property by adverse possession for the required number of years under the doctrine of acquisitive prescription. Not qualifying as possessors in good faith, they may acquire ownership over the island only through an interrupted adverse possession for a period of 30 years. So the possessor of that island can acquire it through acquisitive prescription for a period of 30 years. Okay, accession in movables. So um, we have finished discussing accession in immovables, whether natural accession or industrial accession man-made or natural, now we now go to accession in movables. Whenever two movable things belonging to different owners under Article 466 are without bad faith united in such a way that they form a single object, the owner of the principal thing acquires the accessory, indemnifying the former thereof for its value. For example, a gold ring and a diamond Okay, if they are joined, okay, if they're, they're, they are two movable things, if they are joined, okay, then the owner of the principal acquires the accessory, indemnifying the uh, owner of the accessory for its value. Article 467, the principal thing as between two things incorporated is deemed to be that to which the other has been united as an ornament or for its use or perfection. So in the case of the ring, uh, the one which is more valuable is the diamond. Okay, but the 
the uh, the principal thereof which will be considered as principal is it according to price or according to use okay so there are different uh, uh, criteria to determine the principal thing one of which is the use the other one is the other one is the price okay if it can be determined by the rule which of the two things is the principal okay the one the of the greater value shall be considered and as between two things of equal value that of the greater whole okay so you determine the amount uh, one which is greater in amount shall be deemed to be the principal or if they are equal then one which is the greater whole in painting and sculpture, writings, printed matter, engraving, and lithographs, the board, metal, stone, canvas, paper, or parchment shall be deemed as the accessory thing. So Article 469, whenever the things united can be separated without injury, their respective owners may demand their separation. Okay. Nevertheless, in case the thing united for the use, embellishment, or perfection of the other is much more precious than the principal thing, the owner of the former may demand its separation, even though the thing to, wing, to which it has been incorporated may suffer some injury. Article 470. Whenever the owner of the accessory thing has made the incorporation in bad faith, he shall lose the thing incorporated and shall have the obligation to indemnify the owner of the principal thing for damages he may have suffered. If the one who has acted in bad faith is the owner of the principal thing, the owner of the accessory thing shall have the right to choose between the former paying him its value or that the thing belonging to him be separated even though for this purpose it is necessary to destroy the principal thing. In both cases, there shall be indemnity for damages. If either one of the owners has made the incorporation with the knowledge and without objection of the other, their respective rights shall be determined as though both acted in bad faith. Article 471, whenever the owner of the material employed without his consent as a right to an indemnity, he may demand that this consists in the delivery of a thing equal in kind and value and in all other respects to that employed or else in the price thereof according to expert appraisal. Okay, now we go to mixtures. Article 470, if by the will of their owners, two things of the same or different kinds are mixed, or if the mixture occurs by chance, and in the latter case, the things are not separable without injury, each owner shall acquire a right proportional to the part belonging to him, bearing in mind the value of the things mixed or not. So, for example, you have you have rice. One is NFA, and the other is one, uh, let's say, Milagrosa. Then they are mixed, okay, by the will of the owners. Okay, each of the owners shall acquire proportional to the part belonging to him. So if one is half kaban and the other is one kaban, then they will acquire uh, portions. So they, be, they will become co-owners of the new mixture and they will acquire uh, the portion of the property which originally belonged to him. Okay. Bearing in mind its value of the things which are mixed. So if the will, by the will of only one owner, but in good faith, two things of the same or different kinds are mixed or confused, the rights of the owner shall be determined by the provisions of the preceding article. If the one who caused the mixture acted in good faith, he shall lose the thing belonging to him besides being obliged to pay indemnity for the damages caused to the owner of the thing with which his own was mixed. Article 474, one who in good faith employs the material of another in whole or in part in order to make a thing of a different kind shall appropriate the thing thus transformed as his own 
indemnifying the owner of the material for its value. If the material is more precious than the transformed thing or is of more value, its owner may at his option appropriate the new thing to himself after first paying indemnity for the value of the work or demand indemnity for the material. So if in the making of the thing bad faith has intervened, the owner of the material shall have the right to appropriate the work for himself without paying anything to the maker or to demand of the latter that he indemnify him for the value of the material and the damages he may have suffered. However, the owner of the material cannot appropriate the work in case the value of the latter for artistic or scientific reasons is considerably more than the value of the material. So in the preceding articles, sentimental value shall be duly appreciated. So in the that last case, Aguirre versus Peng. So this is a case involving a circular bolted tank, which was sold by Aldaba to Aguirre. Okay. Aguirre, however, failed to take possession of the tank. Okay. Now, Aldaba, again, sold the same tank to Gabriel. Okay. And then Gabriel sold the tank to Leonora. Now, after some alterations made on the tank, Leonora was able to sell the tank to Nasco for 14500 Okay. It is clear that we have here a case of accession by specification. Leonora, as purchaser, acting in good faith, spending 11299 for the reconditioning of the tank, which is later adjudged to belong to the petitioner Aguirre. So Aguirre, as the owner of the tank, would be entitled to any accession thereto. The rule is different where the works or improvements on the accession was made on the property by one who acted in good faith. So, to uphold petitioner's contention that he is entitled to the sum of 14500 the price of the tank in its present condition would be to allow him to enrich himself at the expense of the petition. So that's all for right of accession. Thank you for listening.